join me in prayer. Gracious God, we are, we are blessed. We're blessed with our community of faith. We're blessed by your presence of your Holy Spirit this morning. And Lord, we pray that you would take every request that we bring to you. We lay each request at your feet and pray that your will be done in situations, families, and health. So, Lord, we lift up the King family, continue to minister to them after their time yesterday of Mao's memorial, continue to minister as they go through the weeks where they're missing him. We pray for each one of them that they would be blessed by your touch. Lord, we also pray for each person that has shared a concern about health in their family or a friend. Lord, we pray that you would minister to those folks that have been mentioned on these cards that are struggling with their health issues. And Lord, we lift up various things that people have shared folks that need your touch of encouragement folks that are struggling with depression and other emotional things. Lord, you are the giver of all good things. You know us before we bring these before you, and you have a plan in each one of these person's lives. And so, Lord, we give them to you. We pray for the blood of Jesus to cover all things, for he is good and he is great. And Lord, we pray especially for this coming Tuesday that you would shower our country with peace. Lord, we pray that you would be lifted up by believers and churches and that we would rally to you in prayer that we pray, God, that there would be no upheaval in any of the results of the election. We lift up our world to you, Lord, too. Division, anger, frustration, war. We pray, God, that you, the mighty one, will both show up and do, Lord, your desires in each of those situations. God, we thank you that when we come to you, we come broken. We come messed up. Some of us come with 
tremendous joy. Some of us come with tremendous needs. And Lord, we confess to you as we come are coming to the table this morning that you would speak to us in ways that we have fallen short of you, that we plead the blood of Jesus over us and we receive your forgiveness and your renewal. We can only come because of Jesus who has changed our lives. And we pray for all of these things in the name of Jesus who has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, give me thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is your kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture this morning is from Luke chapter 5, verses 17 through 26. Now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said to him, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier, to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Rise up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins? He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, Arise. Take up your bed and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. Zebedee wouldn't light his lamp and put it under a basket. Put it on the stand where it could light us all. Jesus of Nazareth! I saw what you did to the leper on the road this morning. My friend has been paralyzed since childhood. He has no hope but you. Please, do for him what you did for the leper. That's a rope! Put it back, man! If you are willing, Rabbi, I know you can do this.
You! By whose authority do you teach? Answer me! If you are willing, Rabbi, you know you can. Hey, I'm talking to you! By whom do you teach? Certainly not the authority of any rabbi from Nazareth. Where did you study? Your faith is beautiful. Son, take heart. Your sins are forgiven. Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Right. But I ask you, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven, or rise up and walk? It's easy to say anything, no? But to show you, and so that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. I say to you, my son, rise. Pick up your bed and go home. forgiveness, and healing. As you notice in the, uh, in the video and in the scripture, which is more important, the first thing Jesus does is tells the man that his faith, because of his faith, that he's forgiven. His friends also had faith because Jesus said to them, great is your faith. He looked uh, in the scriptures, he's looking at his friends that lowered him down. When he saw their faith, he said to them, man, your sins are forgiven you. And his friends are probably thinking, but we brought him to be healed. We brought him to be healed of his, because he's, he's been paralyzed his whole life. So they're probably like, all right, that's good. His sins are forgiven. But he told him the first thing. Oh, yeah, that'll help. The first thing he told him, though, was his, his sins are forgiven because that's, that was his biggest need, was forgiveness. Sure, he really needed to be healed of his paralysis, um, many of us, we have needs that are real, that are real, that are great. This world has needs that are real, that are great. But our biggest need is to be forgiven. 
That is our biggest need, to be pardoned by God, to be reconciled to God, and then also experientially to know that we're forgiven. Last week I spoke about having our conscience cleansed so that we're at home in the presence of God, so we're no longer hiding from God, so that we long and look forward to the next opportunity where we get to open up the book, the Word of God, be in His presence and praise, where we can freely lift our hands and worship Him and fill God's ears with all kinds of praise, the way a child is able to freely jump into the arms of their dad or their mom, until we know through and through in our hearts that we're forgiven, we're not going to be as spontaneous. It's kind of strange, kind of like when you meet somebody um, or they're an acquaintance, and the first time you hug them, you know how you're kind of like a little awkward, and you're like, oh, okay. But when our, when our conscience is cleansed, and we know that we know that we're forgiven, we're no longer like the first human beings hiding in the garden with their little leaves, with our religion, with our church attendance, with our little religious things. Rather, we throw those things away and we say, because of the blood of the Lamb, I am thoroughly cleansed and my conscience is clean and I long, my papa's waiting for me to go into his presence. Sometimes we hide, as I said last week, behind those little fig leaves like the first human beings and we, it's a calendar perhaps, perhaps it's busyness, perhaps it's a bunch of children we need to feed, a bunch of dishes, a lawn that needs to be mowed. But when we're thoroughly cleansed and we know that we're right with God, we no longer use those fig leaves, our religious roles. And we just say, nope, I'm going to be in the presence of God. There is no substitute. How many of you know religion is no substitute for being in the presence of God, being filled with his presence? There's nothing like having a cleansed conscience. In Ephesians chapter 3, 17, I didn't plan on reading this, so it's not in my notes. I'm going to open up my phone real quick so I could access it. It says this in Ephesians chapter 3. For this reason, I bow before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being, moved, being rooted and established in love, may have the power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and how high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Experiencing God's love is far greater than religion, than churchianity. He says, I want, I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will give you power, that Christ would dwell in your hearts through faith, that you would, would know the depth, the width, the height of the deep, deep love of Jesus because it surpasses anything on earth, that you would be rooted in it, that you would be established in it. Some churches root and establish their people through fear, through guilt, through legalism, and that'll kind of root people for a little bit. Some people root and ground their people in different forms and fads of Christianity, which I'm not going to mention because they're good, but just when they are brought to the front. But there's nothing more powerful than being rooted and established in God's love. To know that you know deep, thoroughly, that you are perfectly loved forever. There's nothing like that, that you can experience. Oh, a good-looking fellow or a good-looking gal could ravish you and make you feel like you're the only one on the earth in that moment, but that can't even compare to having your heart ravished with the love of God, to know that you are perfectly loved once and for all, to be at home in the embrace of God, to know what it's like to live in his presence. I pray that you would trade in religion, and that you would say, Paul, I received that prayer. Let me be filled with the Holy Spirit. And because it's deep, Paul, his next words is, now may God, who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask, think, or imagine, do this for you. Because he says, I know it's a tall order. God is so immeasurable. So to grasp how deeply he loves you, 
You'll never know. And that's what inspired that message last year around this time. You're much more saved than you know. You're much more loved than you know because you're loved and saved perfectly by the God of much, much more. Why did he need to know that he was a sinner that was forgiven? Why is that more important than knowing that we're forgiven than that God heals or that God does miracles or that God does financial breakthroughs? And indeed, God does all those things. How many of you have ever been healed by God? It's a beautiful thing to have your life handed back to you and restored to be redeemed. But you can know that God heals and you can be convinced that God restores life and gives breakthroughs to marriages and breakthroughs and, uh, to human relationships and still commit apostasy. What is an apostate? An apostate is somebody who mentally believes in Jesus, verbally believes in Jesus, but their heart was never set free and they've never come alive, never registered in the Lamb's Book of Life, never born again, never brought from life to death, and they could be very churchy, very zealous, and that's why Jesus in Matthew chapter 7 says, many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy? Didn't we heal? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? And Jesus will say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Not that I knew you and got tired of you. I never knew you. That's amazing, huh? So the first thing Jesus says is your sins are forgiven you. Jesus is going to heal him, of, 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 and, and he'll no longer be paralyzed. But his greatest need, and my greatest need, your greatest need, is to know that you know that you're totally forgiven, that you're genuinely saved. Because simply knowing that God heals still makes you a candidate to become an apostate one day. But to know that you know that, that you're thoroughly forgiven, thoroughly cleansed, you'll never apostatize. You might backslide. Anybody ever backslide up in here? But you'll never commit apostasy when Jesus dwells in your heart by faith and takes up permanent res residence in your heart. And so therefore, Jesus said, the first thing you need, buddy, is to know that you're forgiven. I'm giving you the greatest gift of all, more greater than removing your paralysis. And so what do you feel like climbing a building and tearing a, a hole in a roof to get from God. And you're so upset and unhappy about it. God would want you to remember that you have the greatest thing of all, that you're forgiven, that you could be at home in his embrace and live in his embrace, which there's no better place to be. And yes, God may indeed actually get, help you but if he doesn't, you still have the greatest thing, which is to be embraced by the love of God and to be forgiven. Believing that in Christ God forgives and saves, knowing through and through that that's his nature, that he forgives and he saves, that that's humanity's greatest need. Because it is. Some of your family members and friends have dire, dire, huge needs that are real. But their greatest need, more than a house, more than an education, more than uh, circumstances that are ugly to be removed, their greatest need is to know God, to be filled with him, and to have his forgiveness and have everlasting life. But once we become convinced of that, that that's God's nature, that the eyes of the Lord range to and fro this whole planet, looking for hearts that are his, that he may show himself strong on their behalf, it changes us. Not only are we forgiven, we're like these friends who are willing to climb up a building and tear the roof off the thing to position people to experience God's forgiveness. Knowing and believing that God heals and saves and forgives creates a heart in us where, where we're willing to, uh, at our own inconvenience, our own sacrifice, our own, dis uh, even if it's kind of like ludicrous, to do anything to position people and bring them before Jesus that they might receive his forgiveness and healing. That's one of the signs when you know that you really believe that God forgives. And that's why some of you, you scratch your heads like, why do I keep practicing worship? Why do I keep taking care of God's building that God's people might come or, or, or people from the community might come? 
Why do I keep doing it? Whatever it is, it's because you know that God forgives. And you're trying to create a, a, a space. You're trying to position people to receive Christ's forgiveness. In verse 19, and when they could not find how they might bring him in, they quit. No. Because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the mist before Jesus. When he saw their faith, Jesus saw their faith, that they were willing to climb up on the top of a house, put a hole in the thing, lower the guy down. I believe Jesus sees that in you guys when you're at the park. I believe God sees that in other believers in the city when they, especially in the past, when, uh, when they would create uh, the spirit of Santa Paula and, and Christians from different churches would show up here and create meals. And there's so many awesome ministries in the city. I think Jesus sees your faith. Those of you that join me for pop-up worship, you're like, I don't care. I'm going to go public and inconvenience myself. That's awesome. I think Jesus it says, when Jesus saw their faith, Jesus sees. Again, that passage in 2 Chronicles, the eyes of the Lord range to and fro throughout the whole world, seeking those whose hearts are hit, totally his, that he might show himself strong on their behalf. I'm so proud of you guys because I always see that in you. Year after year, month after month, um, inconveniencing yourself, costing yourself time. I know some of you could be doing other things. Um, you could spend more time than you do. There's, it's awesome to get on cruise ships. It's awesome to get on planes. It's awesome to golf. And some of you, you have the resources that if you wanted, you could do that all the time. And you do do that, but you also make time to build God's house. Jesus sees that. And I think um, this describes our church when he saw their faith. Plural. He saw their faith. He saw a group of friends positioning this one guy. And not only did he see the man's faith. Actually, the text doesn't say that he saw, sees the man's faith. I'm just saying he does because faith is personal. All it says, he saw their faith, plural. I think that's very interesting. Although the man must have had faith, because the Bible teaches clearly that faith is individual, that we ourselves exercise to receive the Lord. Jesus risked his life when he said, your sins are forgiven. Jesus knew, just like previously in his hometown of Nazareth, when they we're going to shove him off a hill. He knew that, that was risk, he was risking his life when he said, your, your, your sins are forgiven. He could have easily, if not for the sovereign power of God and his own sovereignty, he'd been stoned that day. Verse 21, and when the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who could forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and to go to your house. Jesus answered their questions by healing that man healing the leper as well that he just previously had just healed, he was demonstrating, I am God. You're actually right. Only God could forgive sins. Get up and walk. Basically, he's demonstrating, God's here. And that's why he's saying, your sins are forgiven. Signs, like walking on water, calling Lazarus out of the dead, out of the cave, after being dead three days, Jesus raising uh, Jairus' daughter from death, Jesus raising a young kid from death and restoring him to his mom, Jesus multiplying bread and feeding twice 
uh, 9,000 and 12,000, I could be wrong in the numbers, were all signs and miracles that people would know God is here with you. And Jesus is demonstrating, I'm God. I could raise a paralyzed man, clean a leopard, cause people to rise from the dead so that you will know that you are thoroughly forgiven. He's demonstrating, I'm God, much taller than your biggest mistake, much higher and loftier than the worst month you've ever lived. Take it to your heart. He's, he, in the, the text, man, your sins are forgiven, plural, in the perfect tense in the Greek, which means the results cannot be changed. God, uh, God Almighty is telling you, your sins are forgiven. So all these miracles, walking on water, raising the dead, demonstrate he's God and demonstrates that he has all authority so that we could, we could take it to heart. I am utterly and thoroughly forgiven. And he didn't say sin. He said sins, plural, in the perfect tense. Man, your sins are forgiven. You should put your name in there. Instead of man, your sins are forgiven, plural, forever. That's amazing, isn't it? To know that your multitude of sins, okay, not multitude, your little grouping, that your sins are forgiven once and for all. So these signs, I doubt it very much. God could do whatever he wants, but I just, uh, I don't think he is, though. In the Old Testament, God opened up the Red Sea so that the people of God could walk through. Through his prophets, he raised the dead. Uh, he spared Noah's life. There's Jonah and there's a host of other supernatural things that are never going to be replicated so that the whole planet would know Jehovah God is God. And that's it. There's no other God. He did big time miracles. Jesus comes and does miracles. Like I've already mentioned, all the different raising people from the dead, multiplying food. If God wants you, those things could be replicated, but I don't think they are. Jesus is saying, this is my only son. There is one way to God the Father, Jesus Christ. And that's why, although God may do miracles, God does miracles. How many of you have experienced a miracle? So God does miracles. But these miracles that we're reading about now, lepers, paralyzed people from birth, no longer being paralytic. I could be wrong because, again, God's sovereign. He can do whatever he wants. But I just don't think he's going to allow human beings to do what Jesus did because then people would think there's new saviors or multiple saviors. But, but to stamp, there is one savior, and that's it. All of his miracles are unique and, my personal opinion, unrepeatable. I mean, if you could find a preacher that could raise somebody from the dead after being dead three days, please get them hired here. <laughs> if you could find a preacher that could multiply bread and feed 12,000 people, tell Kay. She'll, like, make him the president, right, of uh, many, of a uh, spirit of Santa Paula. But Jesus is the only Savior, and that's why I believe the miracles we see in the Old Testament, the miracles we see in the New Testament, will never be repeated because they, they say clearly there is only one God, Jehovah, and he has one son, Jesus Christ. And, and all these miracles should inform us, I am thoroughly saved. The leper was thoroughly cleansed. The paralytic totally restored, impossible. Demoniacs with legions of demons that people locked up, people that were deemed throwaways, God totally put this individual in his right mind. I am totally in the right condition before God, thoroughly cleansed, once and for all, forever in his hand. Nobody could pluck us out. All these miracles show us that God Almighty has the authority to tell you all your sins are forgiven and it's forever. Isn't God good? good? Give, him the, give the Lord a round of applause for his goodness and his forgiveness. Let's pre prepare our hearts and our minds for communion. Today we're going to start a new tradition, which I observed at Carpinteria Community Church when I went to preach there about six or eight weeks ago. I'm going to continue to do the words of institution with Bob, but then Bob and another elder, and today it'll be uh, 
Chris, they're going to serve you communion. I'm going to go to that corner and just kind of hang out prayerfully. And if you want someone to lay hands on you, I'll be there. And if you're an elder or deacon, you want to help me lay hands on people, you're also welcome because uh, this hand is no different from your hand. So you can help me. But that's what we're going to do uh, for a while is we'll be hanging out there. So after you receive communion, you're welcome to circle back and receive personal prayer. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. In the same manner, our Lord took a jar of wine and he poured it into a cup. And he said, this is my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This is the blood of the new covenant. And not, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we do declare that the Lord lived, he died, he rose, and that his living presence inside of us makes a real difference in how we live and operate in this world. And these are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. And all of God's people are welcome to the Lord's table. Come and eat in faith.
thank you, God, for the blessings you bestow upon us every day. We know all things have come from you, our family, our friends, our church family, our community, our daily support and sustenance. And we take this opportunity to return to you only a small portion of the gifts that you have given to us and the offerings we received this morning and the pledges recognized last week. We ask for your guidance, Lord, as we turn our time and talents to your mission, furthering your love, your kindness, your word, carrying your light into a world of darkness. And we all say, amen. Please rise to sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Remember what a good friend we have in Jesus. Yes. Now, before I give the blessing, please remember to go up and pray, say a prayer for Alice 
as you put your hands on her um, quilt. Now receive the blessing of God. And now may the powerful love of God, the tremendous grace and forgiveness of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit may it dwell within you as you go from here. Amen. Pain.